know where this year went. Yesterday, I saw that post on Facebook that said, four more Saturdays and it's Christmas. I don't know about you, but that was quite a reality check for me. Some of you have already started your Christmas shopping and it's not Christmas Eve yet. I don't understand you. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the 35th book of the Old Testament, known as Habakkuk. 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 <laughs> what an interesting prophet that he was. The book of Habakkuk is not directly addressed to God's people. As, as the other minor prophets were. <clears throat> no. Rather, it's a dialogue between the prophet and God. The book's almost entirely a back and forth conversation in which Habakkuk is deeply honest with God. And he asked God difficult questions and struggles with reconciling what he knows about God's character with what God's current actions currently, what they were. He wonders why a, a, a nation more wicked, Babylon, will be able to win a victory over a less wicked nation, Judah. When you look at the third chapter, the third chapter of Habakkuk, it says in verses 17, verses 17 and 18, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yeah, I want to stop there a minute because I want you to... Th th these are the closing words of Habakkuk in his book. And, and, and quite frankly, this is not a good ending. Even though there's going to be a famine, even though there's not going to be any, any herds in the flock, any, any animals in the stock, even if all of that, if this is a bad situation that is coming, Habakkuk says, even though all these things should happen, in verse 18 he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk was a prophet. A, they call him a minor prophet. And the difference between a major and minor prophet is, is, is nothing to do with how important they were. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, those were the major prophets. And they were called major prophets simply because of the length of their books. How many words? That's it. That, that's, that's it. And we, and we see Habakkuk is the eighth of twelve minor prophets. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi come after him. But he prophesied during the time of Zephaniah and Jeremiah. In this time period, the King Josiah, who brought such wonderful reform to the people as a child king, growing up in teenage years and, 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 and reinstituting the worship in the temple after he cleared it out, had it cleansed, had it rebuilt, celebrated the, the, the Passover and, 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 and was, was big on teaching the law and obeying the law. That king has passed. 
he went to war against Pharaoh. Pharaoh was, was going out to battle against the Babylonians and Josiah was going to stop him. And Pharaoh said, stay home. My battle's not with you. Yet he did not. And, and he was killed in that battle. And upon his death, you would think the revival that he, he spent all this time bringing would be beneficial to the people, but no more had the grave been closed than the immorality of the people returned. Returned. And one of his children ascended to the throne and was not a good king. As the king goes, so goes the people. Habakkuk, Jeremiah, witnessed the sinfulness, Zephaniah, the sinfulness of the people and pleaded with them, turn your ways, turn your ways, turn your ways. Habakkuk witnessed all of this and he's seeing the Babylonians. They are right on the forefront. They're at the door. They're going to be knocking very soon. And Habakkuk is just questioning, Lord, why? Why are you so slow in your judgment? I, you, you said you are, are a righteous, you cannot look at unrighteousness, but yet this continues to go on. And by the way, God, how can you use someone like the Babylonians? They're a horrible people. They are an evil people. How can you use them to bring judgment? They're more ungodly than we are. And yet, God answers. When you look at the book of Habakkuk, you're going to see a division in three parts. Chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 5. We see where Habakkuk literally laments over Israel's injustice. Verse 6 of chapter 2 to the end of chapter 2, verse 20. God announces the woes that he's going to bring. Not upon Israel or Judah, that southern country. No. Upon Babylon. Even though he will use Babylon to judge them, Babylon's judgment will come also. In chapter 3, Habakkuk calls for trusting in God and his justice. Trusting in God and, and, and his justice. So when you, when you see... Basically, he's, he's saying, God, if all of these things are to happen that you have just told me, it's going to be a bad time. But you know what? I will rejoice in the Lord. Now, what's that got to do with where we're at today? Because that's where we're at today. You know, I look around and I see I, I watched a video two or three weeks ago, and, and, and it, it was heartbreaking to me. And you'll be hearing a sermon in January, coming in January. Phenomenal. 38 billion, listen to me, billion dollar industry. And it's ruining our nation. The number of men that it involves is staggering. I will just go out on a limb and I will tell you, you have a teenage son or daughter, you need to get their cell phone. And you need to look and I will almost 90% guarantee you there is pornography on there. Not that they happened upon and went, oops, I got to close that. But they have did you hear what I said? 90% of our teenagers. If you don't believe that is true, ask our youth minister. It's true. The number of our, of our kids that have confided in, 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 in him and in, in, in his fiance. This, and it's not just men, it's women. When you go to the state penitentiary, you look at the guys that are hardcore criminals 
And do you know what they will tell you was the first thing that they got into? Not drugs. Pornography. Pornography led to the drug use. The drug use led to, and it just goes. And we live that, and it's not just our kids. Listen, the str I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. The struggle is there for me. I can't go to my cell phone, but once a week, bam, it's right there in front of me. And you know what I found to do? You hit the X and get out of there quickly. You go and you find it and, 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 and hide this ad or whatever it is from me. You get off the website that is there. Why is that such a problem? Our families are in disarray because of, I believe, the pornographic problem we have in our society today. We have, we, we, it's, it's, hey, we don't have to get married, let's just live together. We don't have to. And listen, if I don't want to be a guy today, I'm going to be a girl. If I don't want to, I have yet to find some girl that says, well, I want to be a guy. I have yet to see a girl that says, well, I want to get in the NFL. I'm going to identify as a man so I can play in men's sports. I don't hear that. But we've got gender dysphoria Folks, it's not confusion. It's dysphoria. We ain't got a clue what's going on in our world. The importance of God is no longer there. And we say, yeah, but by golly, we got Roe versus Wade. We got that turned around and life is good again. No, our babies are still being murdered, but they are being murdered at an unrecorded level because even in Oklahoma, where it is illegal to have an abortion, you can get on any website that has prescription drug and you can buy the morning after pill, which causes an abort the lady to abort that child that she has in her body now. Crime. Murder. Sexual immorality. Incest. It's all just gone crazy. We can worship any God we want in our country so long as it's not Jehovah God. You can bash Jehovah God in any movie, in any play, in any book, in any periodical, in any classroom, but you can't say anything against Muhammad, Islam, Hare Krishna, any other. You can't do that, but, but Christianity is open season. Make no mistake. We are on a parallel course with you. Sometimes I think we're worse. I think we're worse. Now I say all that because, you know, the main idea of the message today is learning to be grateful is about much more than your immediate circumstances. You can't let what's going on in life determine the level of thanksgiving that you have in your life. You know, it's, it, it's just sometimes depressing. It's depressing. I, I don't care what economists say. I don't care what these feel-good preachers have to say. I know what God's Word says, and what God's Word says is, if you do not obey my Word, you will be cursed. Hey, God only gave us ten words. That's what the Ten Commandments are. It was ten words in Hebrew. That was it. God gave us ten laws that we have to obey. And we struggle with that. How can we keep anything else? No, instead, we need to let our thankfulness spring from our understanding of God's character. And I think this is what we see when, when we get into Habakkuk. Though, though the tree should not blossom. And you have to understand, this is livelihood. They didn't have the supermarket in Habakkuk's time that you go buy your food at. If you didn't get the fruit from the tree, 
Well, some of you grew up where, where you canned your vegetables, you dried some of the vegetables, and if you didn't have it that year, guess what happened for the winter? You got hungry. Or in our world today, we renamed it hangry. We got hangry, and that means you're not just hungry, you're mad. And there's nothing worse than someone that's hungry and mad. But he tells us, tree quit then blossom, fruit on the vine, produce of the olive fail, fields have no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, there be no herd in the stall, that doesn't matter, I will I will praise you, I will thank you, I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. We need to understand the character of God and we need to be thankful for that character of God. That character of who God is. That whole third chapter is, is a prayer of Habakkuk. And toward the end of that, that prayer, he recognizes that hardship that's there. And, and it comes with God's judgment. But he will remember God. You know, our ultimate source of thanksgiving should be the character the characteristics of God. From what God has revealed about himself through his word and through Jesus Christ. And this morning I want to share very quickly with you the character of God and what to be thankful for. What? Number one, his love. His love. But God shows us, demonstrates his own love toward us. While we're at our worst, he gave us his best. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, husbands, you ever get mad at your wife? No, no, let me change it. Wives, you ever get mad at your husbands? You ever get mad at your husband? And you're going, today? I haven't been home long enough for Jill to get mad at me yet. Listen, they still love us, though. They still love us. I'm glad Jill didn't say, I'm tired of you, throw me out with the bathwater. <laughs> Left my dirty socks in the middle of the, of the living room floor. I just, you know, the different thing. That's God. But not only that, when you look at, at, at the character of love, that's who God is. John says in 1 John 4, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God because God, listen, are you ready? God is love. I'm so thankful for his character of love. He loved me. I'm glad he loved me when, when I was 13 years old and, and, and I didn't know any different than anything. We had a funeral this week for one of my great aunts and my mom's family, that side of the family. The, the lady that, 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 that her great uncle married, she, she was go to church, never missed. He walked right by a lot of churches. And you know, that's the nature of that, of that family. I mean, of that family. They just didn't go to church. But yeah, what a testimony it was to hear when he was 33 years old. He got up one Sunday morning, went to church, and got saved. See, that's the love of God. And I'm so glad that he loves us. Not just his, his characteristic of love, but secondly, his patience. <laughs> Psalm 103.10 says, He does not deal with us according to our sins. <clears throat> Let me put that in a different English. I call it Oki English. He don't give us what we deserve. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. He's patient with us. No, no. In 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through, through 10, he says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years a day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, 
slowness, but is, get this, is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. He's patient with us so that none would perish. You know, I, I remember with my kids, I, I gave them some leeway, gave them some leeway, but you know, as a parent, there's that time when you've got to pull that rope back in. We've got to hem them, herd them back in, which usually requires discipline. God will, I can think of my own life when God has disciplined me, and, and rightfully so, but you know what I found out in, in looking at my life now and where, where it is and where it was is he didn't give me near what I needed. Or what he gave me what I needed. He didn't give me what I deserve. And every one of us deserve what? Hell. But in his love, he's patient with us. Patient with us. But thirdly, I want you to see a characteristic we need to look at is his salvation. I remember Romans 10, 13. For all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, did that say only the good that call upon the name of the Lord? Did that say only those who are call upon the name? No. All. In the Greek, that's a, that, it's pos pon ponos. It, it is an all-inclusive, everyone, nothing left out. All of God's creation in his own image. All who call upon him shall be saved. Why? Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The characteristic of love, of patience, salvation. But there's yet a fourth one, and that's his sovereignty. Here's, I think, where, where, where a lot of us struggle with. Sovereignty, that means he's Lord, he is king. When you read Colossians 1, 15 and 16, he says, talking about Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. Did you catch that? Where is your name in that part of creation? Did God consult you? Did he need our opinion? No. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does as he pleases. Even Habakkuk questions God. But God knows what's right because he is sovereign. Proverbs 19.21 Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Hey, we can pick up all these great good things, but you know what? It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of life if it's not in line with what God's word said. If it's not what his will is, you're just spinning your wheels. Acts 5.39 as, 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 as the disciples were brought in to the Sanhedrin for yet the second or third time, and, and, and they're trying to figure out, what are we going to do with these guys? And they're trying to figure out, and they, they have the disciples or the apostles leave the room, and a guy named by Gamaliel gets up and listen to what he says. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. You may think your way is the right way, but God is sovereign. Listen, if God's word says it's appointed for every man wants to die and then the judgment, can I give you a news flash? You will stand before God at judgment. You will stand as a believer, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, or you will stand as a non-believer, Revelation 
20 verse 11. We get our crowns in Corinthian, and we get the lake of fire in Revelation. If what God's word says is true, and I believe it's true, he is sovereign, and I don't care what you want to reword, rename, redo, re whatever, God will have his way. Amen. How about the characteristic of his wisdom? When you look at the characteristic of his wisdom, Proverbs 2 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. The beginning. The fear, the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? It comes from God. It comes from God. Romans 11, 35. 33 to 35. Oh, the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How indescribable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor, or who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? It's God where we get our wisdom. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad I don't stand up here and say, here's what we need to do this week? You know, my track record's pretty good, but my track record's not perfect. And when I say my track record's good, remember in Sunday school we said, Rex, if you bat 300 in Major League Baseball, you got a good record. Well, that's probably what my record is for being obedient, I think. I don't want to follow someone that's 300. I don't want to follow someone who's 500. I want to follow someone who's right on the mark. The only one that can do that is God. We need to thank God for his wisdom. But let me close with this. We need to thank God for his mercy. For his mercy. Oh, there's so many scripture that are here. Psalm 103 verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Go back to the second Peter passage where God is, is, is patient. How about Lamentations or uh, Lamentations 322, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore the Lord walks, uh, the, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in afflictions with the comfort of with which we ourselves were comforted by God because of his mercies. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us. Did you catch that? Mercy and love put together. And let me close with this one in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30 and 31. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days because of your disobedience, because of the curses... When all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. That's the nature of God. We have so much to be thankful for. Thankful for his love. Thankful for his patience, his salvation, his sovereignty, his wisdom, and his mercy. I love that verse. That none should perish. You're here today. You are experiencing the patience of God. He is patiently waiting on you to become that believer. He's patiently waiting on you to be obedient to
through his word, through baptism, through being part of the church family that is here. He is patiently waiting on you to move off the course you were on. As a believer, walking away from him, he's patiently waiting for you, extending mercy for you as David. Restore to me the joy of that salvation once again, O oh God. Redeem me. God redeemed us, and he wants to restore to us his patience and mercy. But do not mistake the patience of the mercy or mercy of God as a pass. There will come a day. But you know, we don't know when that day is. Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it next week? No man knows. Well, what if it is tonight? Well, if it's tonight, you don't need to be at church because I'm not going to be here. What if it is tonight? Are you ready? Are you ready to stand before the God who is loving, who is patient? who is merciful, who gives us salvation, who gives us wisdom, who gives us all of those things. Are you ready to acknowledge him this morning? Why not during our hymn of invitation? Come. There is a fountain for our hymn of invitation, 224. Let us pray. Let's stand. Father, thank you for today, and I thank you for that fountain that's flowing from Emmanuel's face. It just took one drop. But there was so much more that was shed in Calvary. And let us hold on for what we have to be thankful for today. Not the circumstances around us, but the circumstance we're at. For one who doesn't know you, one who needs to come back to you, let them do so this morning. In your name we pray, Jesus.